Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Satyajit Rath, and we are going to discuss some of the drug trials which are on and some of the results which have come, and also on some of the vaccine trials. Satyajit, good to have you with us as always. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start with this hydroxychloroquine trial, which the WHO has said that they're no longer going to use on the one arm of the solidarity trials. What does it mean, and why did this happen? So, um, as far as one can make out from information in the public domain, WHO solidarity trial, which is essentially many um, medical centers from many countries participating with a common protocol in a WHO coordinated uh, set of trials rather than just a hydroxychloroquine trial. So, it's really a framework for COVID-19 related trials uh, to be simultaneously held in multiple countries so that one can um, sort of leapfrog um, drug and vaccine development. Um, what seems to have happened is that um, an examination seems to have come up with information that um, there are possibilities of side effects. Now, I'm not actually sure. I haven't seen the information clearly enough to be sure exactly what side effects Although, given that hydroxychloroquine generates uh, heart-related uh, um, irregularities and similar side effects, one assumes that it is that. But WHO's uh, trial-related um, advisory group, which recommended stopping the uh, arm, has apparently said that this is being done not because there is um, clear difficulty with hydroxychloroquine, but simply out of an abundance of caution, um, just to be on the safe side. Now, there's a twist to this very recently. And the twist is, how many participant medical centers are uh, based in Australia? And of, from those how many people have been affected in which category of death and severe illness and so on and so forth seems to be somewhat uh, uncertain. So there is a 69 cases versus 73 cases and four centers instead of five centers difficulty going on. Part of the difficulty is also because the data uh, collation and management is being done by um, um, a private uh, company and um, this company, I'm missing the name, not Biosphere, but some similar name, um, is, is uh, being uh, politely so far accused of a certain lack of transparency. They in turn are being indignant about this. There seems to be some data weaknesses, that's a polite way of putting it, and it's not very clear what the numbers have been. So given that, the argument would still be that it is still unclear that whether there is any benefit or not. Ah, so let's be very clear about this. So far, there is one positive finding and one negative finding that nobody will dispute. The positive finding is hydroxychloroquine does have side effects. Yes, of course. We know nobody that. is going to dispute this. Yes. So. It's one thing for people with an illness for which hydroxychloroquine is an appropriate medicine to be taking that and dealing with the risk and the side effects. It's completely a different thing for completely healthy people to be taking hydroxychloroquine, a drug with known side effects and significant ones, as a prophylaxis, as a preventive. So that's what I'm calling the positive finding, that it does have side effects, that it, nobody disputes this. The so negative finding is... that Trump should be aware of it by now? Or he's not really familiar with science, so it's all right for him. <laughs> it's not clear whether uh, the President of the United States of America is actually taking it or not. Okay. Um, that he's saying he's taking it is, is uh, not evidence. Uh, Particularly in his 
So let's go further on the hydroxychloroquine. So, but the negative finding about hydroxychloroquine that again everybody will agree with paradoxically is that currently there is no clear cut strong evidence that says that in a clinical situation either as a preventive or as a therapeutic hydroxychloroquine has demonstrated effects in covid-19 everybody who is advocating it is not advocating it because they think there is evidence to support it they are advocating it because they think it's possible that it may have effects and that seems to me a remarkably wishy washy basis on which national uh, um, authorities are basing uh, a propagation of hydroxychloroquine either as a therapeutic or as a, a preventive medication so you are talking so, really with this case of the icmr strongly suggesting that they will go forward with hydroxychloroquine as a, as a, as a medicine in covid-19 cases so um the most recent information in the public domain that i have seen is that icmr says that icmr has its own data and evidence that hydroxychloroquine does offer covid-19 benefits now because that's just a statement in the public domain we have no idea whether that's as a prophylaxis or as treatment we have no idea what the numbers are we i i i i find myself unable to comment because we don't know so if they have it does it transparency demand that it should be in the public domain one well, particularly when you appeal on the basis of science not on the basis of belief but on the other hand icmr's advice about hydroxychloroquine then he is in the same category as the ayush ministry's many advisories about uh, many interventions for covid-19 are both as uh, preventive and as strict and we will politely leave it at that not go further in the kind of advisories they might have issued coming back to the issue of drugs among the repurposed drugs you had earlier also said the antivirals would have some effect provided it's given early remdesivir could be a part of that some other antivirals are also being used but apart from that are for instance other medicines which have recently been talked about like blood thinners because clotting seems to be one of the major problems that people have encountered particularly those with lung conditions and also pulmonary conditions i mean also about heart conditions do you think that makes some sense oh i am sure that it uh, is worth trying clearly there is a rationale because in severely ill covid-19 affected individuals um in whom as we have noted earlier in these conversations there is an extraordinary and interestingly wide diversity of symptoms and of and of um, organs affected um, which includes uh, blood clotting related difficulties um, so clearly there is a rationale for testing these sorts of shall we say broadly call them supportive therapies in severely ill covid-19 patients again i have yet to see a formal clinical trial result but there there are an increasing number of anecdotal reports uh, of of these kinds of interventions being useful um again that's normal practice um, that hospitals intensive care um, centers especially academically inclined intensive care centers will uh, systematically plan and look for these what appear to be small interventions but that will if they are even moderately successful make a lot of difference to patients who are critically sick so um i i suspect that at least for some patients these kinds of interventions are going to be useful and this would also explain why uh, the oxygenation levels are low 
but the patients uh, are not that badly off initially. And uh, could it be that because blood clotting does affect that in the lung is one of the reasons? Yes, I know that's being said. And quite frankly, I haven't quite understood the logic that connects those two pathways. Sure. So for me, the, um, the happy hypoxic COVID-19 patient, um, <laughs> to use sort of uh, hospital speak, uh, that, that the reduction in oxygenation levels is quite drastic, and yet the patient is not feeling as horribly ill as those levels would lead the doctors to expect. That um, scenario still remains somewhat of a mystery to me. And I would be very interested as and when um, people working on this field in clinical research begin to find at least indications of what combination of circumstances in the bodies of these patients lead to this outcome. Coming back to the vaccine, the other, other issue that's of course of great interest to everybody, do you think that there is any further uh, re revelations in terms of results that have come? For instance, we discussed earlier that we have yet to see the Moderna results and there have been a lot of criticism later that there were supposed to be 46 or 45 patients which were supposed to be tested. Why only eight uh, results were declared or 12 results declared? So does it mean that these are the good ones to show and the others were not? That controversy doesn't seem to have resulted in any uh, later data releases by modern. Not, not, again, not that I have seen. And for me, it's interesting that there is so much of um, understandably obsessive focus on what ought to be careful, cautious evaluation. First of the safety and second of the simply the immunogenicity, meaning the ability to generate an immune response, not the ability to protect mind you, just to generate an immune response. On those phases of human trials for all of these vaccines, instead, we are now um, uh, obsessively focusing on every small piece of either data or its absence. And it says something about just how anxious the world is for there to be a vaccine. Or and for certain countries to actually try and push these things up in the belief that they will control the vaccine market. The US has been sort of bribing off Sanofi earlier, now AstraZeneca as well. So see, they seem to be going around the world with, a, with money bags and saying, hey, we get the first dibs and we'll give you so many billion dollars. And trying and to buy companies which they didn't succeed. So do you think all of this is also the reason why it so gets so hyped up? Apart from the share price, Moderna doesn't have any medicine or vaccine in the market, but it's now, it's, the share price is somewhere near, I think, $30 billion or something, the total uh, market capitalization of Moderna. It's a, it's a very, very high... Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There is no question that uh, the, the, the profit motive of uh, major biotech and pharma industries uh, is playing an enormous outsized role in um, a great deal of the discourse around, around this. But let me make two points about this. Um, one, we have now come to the point where we begin to look at one individual apparently in the vaccine trial who has complained that he or she, she, they, whatever, whatever felt uh, more seriously unwell with the vaccine. Um, and, and, and the response of one individual has now become a, a major talking point. And that says something both about transparency and about the stakes involved. But less, uh, uh, less lightly, a little more seriously, it's also interesting from the point of view of the rest of the world that yesterday's issue of science, I think, 
carries a large opinion piece, a perspective piece, I think it's called, authored amongst others by um, Anthony Fauci and Francis Collins, the former as uh, the official point person of the US government for infectious diseases, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and Francis Collins as the director of the National Institute of Health. Um, they have written a perspective that is somewhat at odds with a completely market-oriented approach to vaccine uh, distribution and dissemination. They have now laid out a very tentative and not very long on detail, but at least a kind of initial conversation about public-private partnerships and how vaccines will be made available via combinations of public sector and private sector commitments to the poorest of this world. Now, um, as I said, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very um, long on good intentions and short on detail piece, but the very fact that senior American academics in the forefront of the anti-COVID-19 research effort, uh, who speak for the government in a variety of ways, have now begun to put themselves into situations where the accessibility of vaccines is an issue that they are beginning to discuss. I think these are the early steps that are going to shape the international political economic discourse as we go forward with the emergence of more than one vaccine candidates as moderately successful in terms of how to make these vaccines accessible easily. You know, it's an interesting issue that Fauci's Institute, what you talked about, the NIAD, is a partner in the modern uh, trials. And it has also not issued any statement. It's really kept quiet even after the modern uh, press release. And Moderna's uh, market cap is no more than $200 billion. So say $30 billion was insulting to Moderna. So I apologize for that mistake. Now, coming back to the issue that you raised, public-private partnership. Now, the voluntary patent pool was the World Health Assembly's resolution uh, that all countries backed except the United States, talked about a voluntary patent pool in which countries would institutions and companies would hand over their vaccines and medicines. And the United States actually gave a note of virtually a note of dissent. It says that this is against intellectual property and which is what drives modern science, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was the only holdout to that. So do you think oh, absolutely. it shows that the American administration is not in favor of considering it a public good, but would like to use it for the strategic interest. If you deal to me, say, yes, sir, you are the greatest God, sir, then we'll give you the vaccine. Otherwise, you can line up uh, wherever you want. Do you think that would be where it would it might end up? Well, certainly, the political leadership um, of the U.S. government is appears quite uh, uh, unambiguously of that position. There's I, I don't think there's any great doubt about that, um, nor, to be honest, is it particularly surprising, given, given the long track record of the U.S. government in protecting its uh, um, so-called intellectual property rights of its industry. Um, it's why I'm finding this uh, recent um, um, uh, write-up interesting, because one can interpret it in a variety of ways. One can interpret it as a sort of second string tactic, a plan B to function as a negotiation ploy. One can interpret it as the sheer um, ethical indignation of these officials as individuals. Um, uh, and and, and they are putting a little bit of pressure perhaps on the 
much more hardline political uh, leadership one can one can interpret it in a variety of ways um, and um, that makes it um, an interesting point of conversation so as we go forward we will hear from political leadership in response to this piece we will hear from other scientific leadership from within that's not as closely allied to the government nor to moderna um, and many of whom have uh, very strongly advocated a completely public uh, um, public good approach good uh, approach to the vaccine and um, and 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 how the this part of the progressive community within the us responds how um, the us partner governments particularly in europe respond to this um, all of this is going to be interesting and it's going to be important and consequential because as we go forward into what i'm calling what i have been calling the vaccine wars the vaccine negotiations uh, to go, going towards the end of this calendar year these uh, are the initial tactical positionings that will show us the configurations of those that struggle yeah in fact president xi and president uh, macron both have come out openly saying this should be public good and most countries of the european union have also oh. said so that's already on the record but coming back to the last question i have of you satyajit you have also been part of the intellectual property rights debate and now you're really talking about patents for remdesivir other antivirals which are being uh, tested we already used them in the aids uh, campaigns and they are available uh, because we have the ability as india to supply them to any country in the world and with a compulsory license allowed by the doha declaration of wto so that's already there and in fact we don't need any patent pool for instance if we want to supply those retrovirals but remdesivir will need a compulsory license and say so will any moderna vaccine or a similar vaccine coming out right now so we also have other or other countries not india alone other countries also have the instrument of uh, compulsory license on which uh, they can rely on oh absolutely and as a matter of fact um i would take the position that uh, um, the covid-19 pandemic if the covid-19 pandemic does not fulfill the section 3d conditions for compulsory licensing So I cannot imagine if that's a different condition section 84 and section 92 of the Indian Patent Act okay compulsory yeah. license and provisions yeah. so uh, if 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 covid-19 pandemic uh, uh, situation does not fulfill the condition for just off the cuff compulsory licensing i cannot imagine what what does um, so that if we cannot invoke compulsory licensing in a covid-19 situation then we are essentially making a mockery of the law because we are basically saying or surrender the law the but we cannot imagine a situation in which we can actually invoke it yeah basically surrendering to surrendering to us uh, multinationals and to the us government which has threatened as you know after the use of the nexavar compulsory license we have fallen foul of us to ustr 301 of course we have always fallen foul of it for different reasons but this has been a specific example given on compulsory licensing and you make a very important point that if these provisions don't we don't know what will and that's exactly the doha declaration which was signed in 2001 if you remember in wto which said two things it said public it said epidemic not pandemic it said epidemic and it also said health emergency and if covid-19 is neither an epidemic or a health emergency we would be very very surprised okay yeah. so yeah. that that's a clear declaration that exists an instrument that exists and you from what you discussed with us earlier that it is possible for countries such as india and other countries also to duplicate what's happening once we know something works duplicating is much easier and remdesivir is actually a small molecule so it's not a one of the biologics which are more complex and more difficult so it shouldn't be much of a problem to also use it or develop it uh, redevelop it again in india certainly certainly quite frankly um 
I'm a little uh, less deeply concerned about drugs such as remdesivir than I am about the vaccines because of a, a, a concern that I have expressed previously, which is um, that you referred to just now, which is that antivirals will have a modest effect in treating the severely ill people. This is not to say that they're not important. It's simply to say that that's a more restricted effect. For me, the vaccines and the vaccines in the plural are going to be the major, to use a um, term that Mr. Trump has uh, uh, somewhat trivialized, the true game changers are going to be the vaccines. And therefore, it's on the vaccines and their uh, wide accessibility that um, I think attention needs to be focused. And that's the reason why I have been focused on arguing that all Indian uh, academic efforts at developing vaccine candidates for COVID-19 in India need to be strongly supported because whether they succeed all the way or not, they provide clear and present evidence that allows us to argue against the patentability of these vaccines in the first place, um, since this is widely understood art. Um, and, and, and therefore, I think that it is that landscape of struggle that's going to take interesting shape as we go forward. So good, Satyajit, what you're pointing out is not only the political struggle, which we can use compulsory licensing, but also the struggle, the scientific struggle, or the struggle in the laboratories we have to wage in order to make some of this possible. So one without the other will not work. We come back to the key of the science movement and the health movement, that science and people's health and movements have to work together. Thank you very much, Satyajit, for being with us. And we hope that we, as it continues, it's going to go on for quite some time, as it looks like, we'll have you with us repeatedly. And certainly before we have successfully, successfully beaten back the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much. This is all the time we have with NewsClick today. Do keep watching NewsClick and do also look at our science shows. Thank <laughs> you.